How do you create movies like Wes Anderson? That's the question on people's minds. With recent TikTok trends, to popular Instagram hashtags, no one can argue that Anderson's style has catapulted him into cinema royalty. So how do you create movies like Wes Anderson? Or more importantly, what makes Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson? Whatever the reason, people have been looking to emulate his aesthetic in photography and storytelling for years. So what characteristics define his films? Well, there are many reoccurring stylistic choices in his creative process. To break this down, we'll look at just four areas. The first is the spectator effect versus realism. Second, symmetry and composition. Third, deeply human themes versus absurdity. And fourth, the color palette he uses. So let's get into it. Let's be honest, Hollywood is full of critically acclaimed films that effectively transport us into another world that the director envisions. A perfect example of this is the massive success of James Cameron Avatar. This film, set on a completely fictional world entirely of Cameron's own making, created a phenomenon known as post-Avatar Depression Syndrome, where moviegoers, upon stepping out of the psychological immersion that they had in the world of Pandora, experienced symptoms of depression. The realization that the fantasy world they existed in for three or four, however many hours it was, didn't actually exist, literally made them depressed. Wes Anderson approaches and wants viewers to approach his storytelling in a completely different way. Anderson, he, he views himself more like a playwright, orchestrating a set design and narrative where we don our Sunday best and go to the theater to watch intently down gold and pearl opera glasses as the crimson curtains pull back and the characters emerge on stage. Anderson wants us to be conscious of the fact that we are spectators, lucky enough to watch his story unfold. We are not in a story like we would be in Avatar. We are in the audience. Utilizing highly curated set design, symmetry, and color coordination, his characters do not exist in our world, but one carefully crafted by their creator. His stories have his fingerprints all over them. In Fantastic Mr. Fox, Anderson actually opted to use real animal fur instead of synthetic on his puppets because every time he moved them, the hair would show signs of his physical manipulation. Something that he wanted to convey to us watching, that he was involved in the process. On top of this, his characters only exist in front of a flat plane. Like actors in front of a painted backdrop, they can only navigate their environment going back and forth, up and down and left and right. We are limited to the visual perspective of someone watching a story play out on stage, never being able to walk amongst the characters and see them from different angles. There are very few moments when Anderson actually breaks from the spectator effect in his films. And when he does, it is always during a deeply emotional human experience. A brilliant example of this is in Life Aquatic when Ned dies. And if you haven't seen the Life Aquatic, what are you talking about? Ned doesn't die, I heard he's doing male modeling somewhere. The switch to handheld filming, a POV viewpoints as waves are crashing against the lens and the water changes from clear to blood red, instantly transports us onto the stage. And right like that, we're there with Steve during Ned's last moments. We're gasping for air and gulping up seawater. We're, we're no longer with the audience. There is no audience. 10 years ago. You know, maybe I should have auto-rotated and performed a high bang through our descent. You might have crashed a little soft, so. I wouldn't make any difference, though. Huh? It seems like this that make this film my second favorite of the Anderson catalog. And just like that, after that scene, we're back into the audience watching again as the actors are on stage acting out the remaining scenes. So how do you capture this spectator effect and use realism in your work in this intentional way? Well, I think there's three most obvious ways to do that. First, highly curate your background. Interact with your subjects against a flat plane. A great example of this is a photographer who goes by the name of Sarah Covey. I encourage you to check out her work, it's really great. Break the spectator effect only in the impactful moments and be intentionally immersive. Okay, now let's jump into symmetry, composition, and the camera shots that Wes Anderson uses. If there was one word that is probably most closely associated with Anderson, it would be symmetry. Symmetry is probably the most obvious and therefore kind of the most replicated trademark style of his films. Quirky characters interacting in front of symmetrical backdrops, 
juxtaposing a balanced stage set with the dysfunctional habits of deeply insecure players on stage. His composition and set design isn't a basic mirror-like understanding of symmetry, however. He often uses imbalanced additions to either side to create an overarching sense of balance in every scene. In addition to symmetrical backdrops, he also regularly uses compositional techniques such as framing, by the leading lines, and anything to draw your attention into the interactions taking place on stage. Much like a picture frame borders a painting, this, his characters are often encircled by windows or doorways as their lives unfold. In addition to composition, in terms of camera shots, Anderson's cameras are almost always mounted and rarely, rarely handheld. He relies heavily on a few key camera movements to display his world. Those camera movements are static shot, whip pan, push in, pull out, led on an illegal suicide mission by a selfish maniac, crash, zoom, trucking shot, And finally, boom shot. While this seems like almost an exhaustive list of all the different types of camera movements a filmmaker has in their arsenal, the omissions to this list I think are much more telling than the admissions. So all of the missing camera shots involve interacting with the scene in an involved kind of dynamic way, lending the perspective of being involved in what is happening on stage, instead of watching it unfold from the audience. If you're wanting to implement kind of like an Anderson-esque filmmaking style, uh, try using largely 2D movements. Just as the audience can't rotate 360 degrees around your characters, uh, neither should you in filmmaking. Find symmetrical locations out in the world or construct your own. Anderson's kind of all about creating a sense of order in a chaotic context. Next, let's jump into themes found within all of the stumps. Okay, so, so far we've dived into the ways that Wes Anderson leaves us as a spectator, more or less, in the events taking place in front of us. We're an audience in a play, a reader of a good book, or a peruser of a publication. From backdrops to composition, everything screams that we are not a part of this world. So naturally, you would assume that his films leave us separated from reality, kind of a fanciful escape to a bizarre imaginary world. This could not be further from the truth. And the reason for that is the themes that weave together each of his films. While Anderson crafts settings that are so exaggerated and characters written to match, the narratives explored contain deeply relatable human experiences. Explorations of joy, uncertainty, familial relationships, depression, loneliness, death, and love are all central to the plot. Shining out between exaggerated character traits, frank dialogue, and dysfunctional relationships in each story. Are these dance keys? Yeah. His name is Royal Tenenbaum. He told us he was already dead. Yeah, well, now he's really dying. I think he's on to us. Of course he is. Of course he is? I don't think you're an asshole. Royal. I just think you're kind of a son of a bitch. Well, I really appreciate that. I think we're just gonna have to be secretly in love with each other and leave it at that, Richie. We've had a rough year, Dad. I know you have, Chazzy. At their heart, these films are existential quests for meaning, while being confronted with the most pure and powerful expressions of humanity. These films hold the nature of a Shakespearean comedy, but without the formal, quote unquote, happy ending. Instead, we're left questioning what is next and what was the meaning of it all? It is beautiful, Steve. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? I wonder if it remembers me. Finally, let's jump into probably the second most recognized trait of Wes Anderson movies. The intentional use of color themes in Wes Anderson sets is probably one of the most iconic aspects of his approach to film. 
Not only do his color choices lend to visually stunning sets and costume design, Anderson actually cleverly uses them to communicate tone and time within his film. The Grand Budapest Hotel is a great example of this. They use vibrant hues of pink, purple, red, and white during scenes recounting the glory of the Grand Budapest of Zero's past but then switches over to yellows, oranges, and browns during scenes where we see an elderly Zero telling a story to Jude Law's character, a kind of coloristic reference to the autumn of the Grand Hotel, or maybe even the autumn of Zero's life. We also see Anderson utilize a switch between black and white in color film in the French Dispatch to communicate different time frames or core themes happening within the film. So that's the best part of the whole thing. Not only does Anderson's intentional use of color lend to his unique aesthetic, but so does his use of analog filming methods. While not an analog purist, using cameras from the Canon EOS line uh, to the Nikon line uh, for stop motion scenes like Fantastic Mr. Fox, Isle of Dogs, or even some in Grand Budapest, Anderson leans heavily into analog cameras for the majority of his productions. The Royal Tenenbaum was shot on 35 millimeter Kodak Vision 250D, uh, and Vision 500T. Moonrise Kingdom used 16 millimeter film, which lent to kind of a grainier, harsher image quality. And he shot on Kodak Vision 3 200T. Grand Budapest, apart from the stop motion and miniature scenes, uh, used a 35 millimeter Kodak Vision 3 200T film. And Anderson's newest release, Asteroid City, utilized Aricam ST and LT cameras and shot on Kodak Vision 3 200T and Eastman Double X. Uh, 35 millimeter film. So how do you create videos with colors that look like Wes Anderson? Well, there's an easy part and a hard part. The easy part is that you take strict control over the color palettes of your sets and your costumes. Pick a color theme and stick to it across the whole production. Whether that's red and baby blue like Steve Zizou in Life Aquatic or rich purple and red like M. Gustav in Grand Budapest, pretty much decide what your color palette is and build your film around that color palette. The hard part comes in capturing natural characteristics of the analog film that Wes Anderson uses to create his films. In a digital age, going analog gets really expensive really, really fast. Even a Super 8 film reel can cost upwards of like 60 bucks before processing to capture just like two to three minutes of footage. So what's the solution for the average videographer looking to capture that kind of analog Anderson aesthetic? but not wanting to blow through hundreds to thousands of dollars worth of 35 millimeter film on every project they do. Luckily for all of us, there is a great film emulation plugin that I like to use called Dehancer Pro. Uh, it's built to work with whatever editing software you use and Dehancer is an incredibly easy way to kind of emulate the look of various film options without the cost and unforgiving nature of actually shooting a project on analog. Dehancer was great enough to partner with me on this video as I set out to capture Anderson-inspired footage to kind of celebrate the release of his most recent film, which at the time I'm making this is Asteroid City. So let's head out and capture some footage and then jump into the DaVinci Resolve and the Dehancer plugin to show you just how easy emulating film looks can be to capture that Anderson aesthetic. And there you have it. It's literally that easy to emulate the different film selections that characterizes Wes Anderson's style. And I get it. There's a lot more to Anderson's style than shooting analog. But in a world where film is really, really flippin' expensive, Dehancer is a lifesaver to get you kind of where you're going. So there you have it. A complete breakdown, probably not, of how to film like Wes Anderson. First, use a spectator effect and create a separation of the audience from the narrative that the audience is fully aware of. Use symmetry in your compositions and only use camera shots that maintain the audience stage perspective. Craft stories with exaggerated characters, but also with deeply, deeply relatable raw human themes. Although the audience is separate from the story, we should be able to relate deeply to it. And finally, be intentional with your use of color selection and utilize color change intentionally to drive forward your plot as you go along. If you are going to utilize analog filming methods, but you don't want to spend thousands of dollars on every single project, check out a great video plugin like Dehancer Pro 
which gives you access to a ton of amazing film types and effects, kind of just allowing you to capture the look and feel of analog film with the ease and forgiving nature of digital. And if you are interested in checking out Dehancer, they've been great enough to offer anyone who signs up using the code that I'm gonna include below in the description uh, to give you a 10% discount on the plugin. So check out the link I have in my description if you are interested in getting uh, that 10% off. If you have made it this far in the video, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like and a subscribe and let me know in the comments, what is your favorite Wes Anderson film? For me, I gotta be honest, it's gonna be Royal Tenenbaums. Anyways, I'll see you next time.